everyone, and welcome to Teach the Web Talks. Uh, you are watching our January edition of the Teach the Web Talks, a monthly call where we get together with uh, educators and professionals from all over the web who talk to us about um, a skill that we can all bring back to our communities to be better teachers of the web and to uh, become better informed about the internet and how we can build it together. So we are here with Stacy Martin and we're going to be talking about Data Privacy Day. Uh, but before I get into that, some technical stuff for anyone who hasn't been on one of these calls before. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd love to hear them and we're going to be asking all of your questions to Stacy or as many as we can get through. And you can send them to us on Twitter using the hashtag TeachTheWeb, or you can send them to us via Discourse, and you'll find the link to Discourse on the Google Hangout page, or you can type them right on the front page of that Google Hangout, and we'll get them here. And we'll try and get as many of those questions as we can answered. So as you think of them, share them with us, and we'll get a conversation going. So. As I mentioned earlier, today is Data Privacy Day. Hopefully you checked in and maybe saw the privacy chat going on uh, on Twitter, just wrapped up now, and you saw some of the great questions there. I, as I was preparing for this talk, I started thinking a lot about what data privacy is and the experiences I've had with privacy in my life. And I was reminded of uh, something I saw a lot on Facebook, especially a couple months ago. I don't know if any of you saw this where you are. But it was a disclaimer people were posting on Facebook that said, I hereby uh, disallow Facebook from sharing any of my pictures. Everything I own is mine. Uh, and the idea is that you could copy this from someone's profile, put it on yours, and it would keep all of your data safe. So if you've read the Snopes article, you know that that doesn't work. Uh, it was a bit of a hoax that went around. But it was very, very popular. And uh, I think it really made me understand and think about that people don't have a lot of information about privacy and they're very worried about it. We all know we share a lot of ourselves online. It's a meaningful way we connect, but it's hard to get accurate information about how to keep your data safe and even what that means. So luckily for us, we don't have to wonder anymore. We have Stacy Martin here. She is the Senior Manager for Privacy and Engagement at Mozilla and she's going to be talking to us about how we can be smart about our online privacy and how we can share this knowledge with others. So, Stacy, uh, why don't you tell the audience who you are, where you're from, and how you got interested in Mozilla. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Happy Data Privacy Day. Um, I am, as, as Lucy mentioned, I am on Mozilla's privacy team, and I'm here in California. And um, I got interested in Mozilla just because it's such an amazing opportunity to do good in the world. That's awesome. I am very envious of your sunny locale right now. Toronto, <laughs> not so far that from New York. That is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> very jealous. So just to get to know you a little bit better, um, why don't you tell us what your first email address was? Do you have a goofy first email address? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, well, I am old enough that I'm not sure I even remember what my first email address was, but I think um, that it was a school email address because I was at um, University of California, Davis, back when the internet started. Um, I know that was a long time ago. And um, they gave us email addresses for school, and it was very exciting. So, But I don't think it was super goofy. It was probably just my name at ucdavis.edu edu or something like that. Gotcha. That's much better than having like one of the ones you made in grade four haunting you forever. <laughs> Can you delete old email addresses? We'll get into that later. Um, yeah. Okay, and what is the first CD you ever bought? <laughs> oh my gosh, you guys keep asking me questions that make me look old. <laughs> um, so um, actually what's, what's more memorable for me, since I am old, is um, my first record album. Isn't that scary? Um, and my first record album was um, Michael Jackson's Thriller. And it was very exciting to have that Ooh. album. That's amazing. I remember seeing that video on probably MTV for the first time. That was Sweet. great. And the last question we were going to ask you is, what was your first password? But it's a trick. Don't answer it. My first question. I can't tell you that. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent answer. Okay, so now that we all know each other a little better, uh, let's get into some of the meat here. So 
firstly, let's just talk about what is Data Privacy Day? Who's involved? What is this day? OK. Um, so Data Privacy Day is January 28th um, every year. Um, I think it's, it started back in, I think it was 2009 or 2008 officially. Um, it's an international day, so it's celebrated all around the world. And um, the goal is to raise awareness and educate consumers, um, empower them through simple and actionable things that they can do, um, and also on the flip side to encourage businesses to be good data stewards. So here in the United States, um, it, is, it is spearheaded by the National Cyber Security Alliance, and they've been leading it here since um, 2011. They run a website um, that has a lot of great tips on it. The website is called staysafeonline.org. And their tagline, you may have seen it, their tagline is Stop, Think, Connect. And um, they have some really good tips on their site, so I would definitely recommend visiting it. Unmute. That's a great place to start. <laughs> Um, so now that we understand a little bit more about the purpose of the day, uh, what is Data Privacy Day? I, data Privacy. I know a lot of people have just been abbreviating it to privacy, but how is data privacy different than regular privacy? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so you can abbreviate them. You can really use them interchangeably. Um, privacy and data privacy are are very similar. Um, Privacy is probably a little bit broader because data privacy is more focused on the relationship between the collection and use of the data, and then on the other side, the expectations and the legal requirements around data. So it's much more information focused, um, but really it's the same concept of giving people control over their own data. Um, way back when, way back like 14 years ago when I started in privacy, um, we used to define privacy as the right to be left alone. And I think that's still a reasonable, good baseline definition. Um, we also, there's a um, luminary in privacy, one of the early privacy pioneers. His name was Dr. Alan Weston. Um, he's deceased now. Um, but he said, privacy is the right of individuals to determine for themselves when, how, and to what extent information about them is communicated to others. So I think that's a really good basic definition, um, both for privacy and for data privacy. Yeah, no, that's very helpful. I like that. I like that definition a lot. Um, so this is one that I saw come up on the privacy chat uh, over on Twitter, and I think is something that comes up a lot when you're talking to people about privacy, especially if you're trying to maybe teach a group who's like younger, doesn't really know why they should care. People say, I have nothing to hide. Why should I care about privacy? Uh -huh. What's your answer to that? I'm sure you hear it a lot. Yes, um, that's actually one of my favorite questions, and we just talked about that a little bit last week in a Google Hangout that we did with the Firefox student ambassadors. And um, I usually use two words to respond to why should you care, um, especially when I'm talking to a younger audience, and those two words are data permanence. So this is really the first time in history that anything you do can be recorded forever and ever and never go away. And so that's everything you post online, every picture, every opinion um, stays around forever. It, and that's, that's something that, that has huge impacts going forward. Um, another um, privacy expert, Larry Poneman, has a great quote, the end of privacy is the end of second chances. And I think it's really important to think about that, um, especially when you're young. You're still changing, and really all of us need privacy in order to be able to make mistakes and in order to be able to try new things and not have them stay with us forever, um, so to be able to learn and grow. And that's why um, a lot of experts will talk about how privacy is really essential to freedom. So privacy is not about having something to hide. It's about being able to choose 
what you want to reveal, and when. And so we lose creativity and we lose innovation when we lose privacy. So, um, so data permanence are the two words, if you don't remember anything else, <laughs> on why you should care about privacy. Um, just keeping in mind that data will, data will stick around online, so privacy is super important. I think that's a quite a valid point you kind of touched on there, is that privacy, I think, means different to every generation. Um, you know, for kind of, I know I worry about, like, what people have access to my data, but I know that the younger generation worry about mm -hmm. privacy on their, like, Facebook and social media. So yeah. how are there ways that you can really protect yourself? Are there ways to protect yourself on social media? Yes. Um, there are. So um, privacy settings are super important on social media, being aware of how you can restrict your audience. Um, we also see people doing kind of interesting things. Um, some people will delete their posts after they're no longer relevant so that you don't have posts that are hanging around forever. Um, other people will shut their account down when they're not there, um, just so that nothing happens on their on their feed when they're not there watching it. So there's lots of interesting things to do, but there are tons of great articles out there on how to set your social media privacy settings. Um, so they are well worth taking a quick look at. It would be really great to get some links to those articles. And sure. does, does that really work if you delete your posts? Like, is it really gone? Or is your post saved somewhere? Um, so it may or may not be really gone. Um, it really depends on whether that post traveled anywhere else, whether somebody else grabbed it, that sort of thing. Um, but I think, it can, I think it can help reduce your risk to some degree. So um, it's hard to say whether you can ever really erase anything off of the Internet. Um, but certainly you can minimize things. Um, yeah, you hear a lot of buzzwords around social media as well, like whitewalling. Can you uh -huh. tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so I think if I understand correctly on, on what whitewalling is, um, I think that's an idea that Dana Boyd talks about, and she does a lot of research. She has some really interesting books on um, social media use um, in younger generations. And so she talks about whitewalling as this concept of periodically um, deleting your content. And so um, it's a, to me, it's an interesting strategy. I'm not, I'm not sure to what degree it works, um, but I certainly don't think it can hurt to do that. It's definitely an option. Mm -hmm. And I think all of this is touching on those two words you said earlier, data permanence. Data permanence, yes. Which is how, and I think it's a big question, is how permanent is something? If I post a picture online and then take it down, I know that kind of once it's off one server and it like gets copied, it's, there are lots of copies of it out there. Like how, yeah, how quickly does it take to have it be something you can't retract? Something that you can what? Can't retract. Oh, that you can't retract. Well, <laughs> I mean, that could happen really quickly. Um, I know, like, one of the popular tools um, that my daughter's generation uses is Instagram, where it, it deletes itself um, within a, a period of time that you set yourself. Um, but in the United States, that was recently, that company was recently, um, um, investigated for um, those not actually going away, that they don't actually disappear. So I think it's it's always a better assumption to assume that anything you put online is permanent and, and think about that before you put it online, and that way you're safest. Okay, thinking ahead. That's gonna be something I have to, I have to work on, because I know that things, <laughs> it's hard to take them back. Thinking ahead, yes, <laughs> that's good. So for people like me, um, or when people who are learning about this stuff and then maybe going out and teaching it to a wider group, not necessarily youth, but when you're talking to your friends and teaching informally as well as formally, um, are there any tools or resources that you especially, or techniques that you especially refer people to when they're wanting to, to teach this stuff? Yeah. Um, so in terms of teaching it, um, 
one of the things that we have at Mozilla actually are some teaching kits and we do have some privacy teaching kits um, through WebMaker and I think that's a great way to reach um, a larger audience with a very structured approach for how to teach it um, and we're always looking for new content there. Um, there's, lot, there's lots of great content that you can share. StaySafeOnline.org, on, as I mentioned, has a lot of teaching tips. I think one of the most effective things that people can do is share with your friends and family. So share what you've learned with other people, even just in an informal setting, asking people simple things like, you know, what, what do you what kinds of passwords um, do you, or what kind of password security do you practice? Do you care about your passwords? Do you think about that? Do you try and set really difficult passwords? And just kind of get a conversation started, I think is a really good way to go. Um, there, are, there are sites like, um, there's one called the Privacy Clearinghouse, um, where they have a lot of really good consumer information. So depending on what audience you're trying to reach, I think it's great to go out and try and um, teach, say, high school students about privacy. Um, there are just all kinds of different groups that you can reach out to to share privacy tips. But the easiest way to start is to just start conversations with your friends and family based on what you've learned. Because I'd like to ask a question around that. I have an event coming up in March, and it, um, for quite young adults, so between the ages of 16 and 14. Um, like, is that too young of an age to start talking about privacy? Because does it mean a different thing when you're talking, again, going back to the generational thing? Would it mean something different? Right. No, actually not at all. Um, there are some interesting articles out there on how um, the privacy talk should become the new sex talk for teens. Um, because it's that important. Um, yeah. And so they're really encouraging that parents should be sitting down, educators should be sitting down with teens and talking to them because of this idea of data permanence, because they can put things online that don't go away. It becomes super important to talk to them about privacy. So no, I think that's a great audience to talk to. Great. Um, I'll definitely check out some of those activities for the younger ones. We do actually have a couple of questions well, we've got one has come up in the chat. Lucy, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, go ahead. You want me to read it? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I see one in the chat that says, with constant threats to privacy, it seems like more and more work... Oh, wait, where did it go? Sorry, well, I'm <laughs> okay. currently answering. <laughs> okay. Um, it seems like more and more work to keep yourself anonymous on the Internet. Besides using Tails or Hunix and Tor, is there a simple way to stay anonymous? Um, so I think what I would recommend as a place to start um, to be more anonymous um, would be using something like private browsing, because I think that's something that's simple enough for everyone to use. Um, and every browser has a form of private browsing. Um, one of the interesting uses that you can test out private browsing and see how it works is if you're looking for um, airline fares. It's really interesting to use one private browsing window and one non-private browsing window and just see if you find that you get different fares, um, especially when you're searching the same fare several times. Um, and, and that'll give you kind of a sense for how private browsing makes it, um, makes it the data about what you're searching for unavailable when you go to search for it again. So I think that one's a good way to test it out and private browsing is something that's a little simpler to use. Can you tell us a little, uh, for me, I don't have that much knowledge behind it, so besides yeah. using Tails or Wanox, what are those? What are they? Yeah. Um, so, so I'm probably one of the more non-technical privacy people. I probably should have brought technical support with me. <laughs> so um, I can tell you a little bit about Tor um, because I'm a little more familiar with Tor. Um, but Tor is basically um, an anonymous browser. So Tor would be sort of like a supercharged version of private browsing. Um, Tails and Hunix I'm not as familiar with, um, so I don't know if there's anybody on this call that is more technical than me, but... Um, <laughs> this is your call to action, are you here? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, we got um, an e and also um, a um, a message on discourse. So someone sent us um, a quite nice question, um, and he's watching right now. Um, I'm really I hope I can say his name right. So it's Ringanuman, um, and so he was asking, what are the current privacy concerns of per of personal data that we face on the internet? What are the current privacy concerns of personal data that we face? Oh gosh, <laughs> um, so there's a wide variety of concerns. Um, let's see, where would be a good place to start? Um, sorry, I got distracted. Someone actually put a, an answer there on Tails um, in the chat. Um, Yay, Doug. So, <laughs> um, protecting your privacy online, you want to think about things you want to think about how much data is being collected about you and how that data can potentially be used. So, for instance, what private browsing does is, is someone can't set a cookie um, to be able to see what you browsed for before and to be able to use that information to market to you. Um, so you want to think about things like what data is being collected as you're just going through and searching and browsing. Search engines also collect data. Um, most of them do. Um, there are some that don't. DuckDuckGo is a good example of an anonymous search engine. But most of them collect data um, just because they're trying to make your searches more personalized so that you get more relevant information. So it's not that collecting data is necessarily bad. It's just that you want to think about, is that, enough, is that a valuable trade-off for you? So is it worth it to you to have them collect some data about you so that your search might be more relevant? Or do you prefer to keep it more anonymous? So you want to think through those things. And then as you're using some of the other things that you do online, like email, are you OK with your email provider um, searching your email um, again, to try and come up with more personalized content for you, or would you prefer an email provider that doesn't do that? Um, social media, same thing. You're getting free content um, in exchange for data that's collected, and so are you okay with that trade-off? So I think that's the best way to think about it online as you're going through your activities, thinking about what kinds of trade-offs you're, you're willing to make. For almost for different kinds of service. Mm -hmm. I wanted to expand on this question a little bit because um, we've talked a lot about ways that we can protect our privacy and ways we can educate ourselves more and I think both of those are really important. Um, but what are some of the issues um, from the other perspective? So like what is the onus on corporations or what are some of the laws that are kind of in the works right now to do some of that protection for us? Because obviously we have a responsibility to do stuff on, on our end, but also we hope that there's some stuff in a legal sense and some other protections that we have or some things that corporations simply cannot do. So what are some of that level of concerns that, that are going on right now? Okay, yeah, that's a great question too. Um, so corporations um, ideally are, their goal is to, should be, <laughs> to be a good steward of your information. Um, and so the way that you can find out how they're handling your information is really to read their privacy policies. Um, organizations will also often have what's called a contextual notice um, at the point where you enter your data. So when you're entering data and you're giving somebody data about yourself, you want to make sure that you're looking for what are they going to do with it. And a lot of times they'll have a notice there. Um, and it might refer you to their, their larger privacy policy for more information. But that's going to give you some sense for how they're handling your information. Um, in terms of laws, those are going to vary significantly around the world. So in the United States, um, traditionally, we don't have as many legal protections um, for data um, as, say, Europe does. So in Europe, traditionally, privacy is viewed as a basic human right. In the United States, it's traditionally been legally protected um, in a very, um, what do you call it, um, in a very segmented 
fashion where um, we, like in the United States, you'll see laws for financial privacy and you'll see laws for healthcare privacy, but they're not, they're not really as broad in the United States traditionally. So legal protections are going to vary um, and companies will come up with their own privacy policies. Most of them are based on some basic private privacy principles that are that are um, pretty widely accepted throughout the world, but they're, the legal protections are going to vary significantly. So that's good good mm -hmm. information, especially about how we interact with companies, um, and it fits right into Doug's question right here. Um, okay that as we're interacting with things on the web, are there any particular types of services web users should just avoid altogether? Um, I, I think it's always a good idea um, to make sure that you're, you know what type of a service you're interacting with. Um, I know nobody <laughs> wants to sit and read a privacy policy for every company that they interact with. In fact, they've done lots of studies that nobody reads them. <laughs> um, and I think there's a really great movie out, out there. There's a really great documentary called Terms and Conditions May Apply. And I think they state in that movie how many years of your life it would take if you actually read every privacy policy for every service you interact with. Um, so, so that's probably not a practical approach, um, but browsers have a lot of protection built into them to keep you away from sites that are, that are known to be malicious, um, so I think that can help, but otherwise I, I think the responsibility is really currently um, on the user to, to understand how companies are treating their data. Excellent. I was just going to kind of ask, like, as an organization, you know, what are the steps that you should be considering about your users? You know, what's, what, you know, we all know what we want to be able to be private, but if you're a large kind of company and you're doing a lot of mail-outs, you know, what are the steps that, to ensure that you're not overstepping the mark with your clients or your users? From the right. corporate perspective. Yeah, from the corporate perspective. Okay. Yeah, so from a corporate perspective, um, companies would want to look at the fair information practices, and um, that's what I was kind of babbling on about <laughs> in one of the earlier questions. Um, and those are really basic things like notice and choice. Um, notice and choice are probably two of the most key privacy principles for companies um, because that's just a great place to start is make sure you're telling people what you're doing with their data and make sure that you're giving them a choice about it. So you mentioned mailings, for example. So as a company, you'd want to decide, am I, and depending on, what, depending on what the legalities are in the jurisdictions that you're sending to, um, but let's say it's in the United States, you're going to want to decide, do I send my mailings as opt-in mailings, where you only receive them if you've actually asked for them? Or do I send them as opt-outs, where you start receiving them, um, and then you just tell me if you no longer want them? Um, making sure you have a working opt-out <laughs> is like a really basic thing when you're sending mailings. Um, so, so I think for companies, notice and choice is probably the most important place to start. But then there's lots of behind-the-scenes stuff that you need to do well in order to manage privacy. So. You want to think about limiting the data that you're collecting, how you're going to secure it, um, how long you're going to keep it. So deletion practices are important. Um, how you're going to give people access if they want to see what data you have on them or they're going to request that you delete it. Um, so all the, all the basics that are really covered in something called the fair information practices I think are a great place for companies to start. It'd be kind of nice if people could have, you know, those kind of privacy settings on the main page as well for some websites when you go there as the first point. Um, yeah. So then you can see straight away because often it's really, really hard, like as a user, to find these, these settings. It is. Um, every website should have a link towards the bottom to their privacy policy. Um, and so, and so that's a great place to look. Um, a lot of, a lot of really smart people have looked at, is there some way that we could do some sort of chart for privacy policies so that you could have sort of a red, green, or yellow kind of an icon approach? Um, so there's been lots of work done on that. Um, but, 
but there's not a comprehensive system for that yet um, to try and simplify it so that everybody isn't spending years of their lives reading privacy policies but can still get the information that they need up front quickly yeah. and easily. Because so a lot of these privacy policies, they're text dense. So they you are. open it up and you're like, oh my, <laughs> you know, yeah. you do have to invest the time to read everything. Well, and that's, a, that's another thing companies can do too, is to try and make those sound a little bit less like a lawyer wrote them um, and try, try and make them a little friendlier and a little shorter. I know that's something we've worked on at Mozilla. We um, went through and revamped our privacy policies a couple years ago and tried to shorten them. Um, and tried to make them what's called layered notices so that you could start with just a simple amount of information and then if you wanted more, you could go down a level to get more information. So I think things like that help too to make them not so dense so that people can read them. Maybe all companies should be required to turn their privacy policies into a blog post as well. <laughs> references yeah. back. Yeah. It's this is what we're going to do with your data. <laughs> And another thing that we do is we have um, five privacy principles. So, and there are other companies who do that too, who have privacy principles. And that kind of gives you a good, simple feel for how the company is going to treat your data too. Um, that doesn't involve reading a really long legalistic notice. And I think those principles probably help answer um, the question that Vinyesh has just asked. I don't know if you can see it there in the Thanks. question queue. <laughs> Um, so I think that's the one that says, now that Mozilla is entering the mobile market, is it also planning to work on privacy with respect to mobile hardware also? Maybe working with vendors who are more open about their hardware. So um, that's actually a really interesting question. Um, mobile is a really interesting area for us um, because there, there are so many vendors that you work with. Um, and we are really interested in how to bring privacy to the mobile space and we've been working with some really interesting ideas on how to do that. Um, we also have for Firefox for Android, we have an add-on called the Privacy Coach and the idea behind the Privacy Coach is to walk you through what kinds of privacy features are on your phone and how to use them. So trying to put that in a really simple somewhat fun, trying to be fun way <laughs> to walk through them. Um, and so we'd like to take that idea and, and apply that more broadly as well. I'm, I'm just going to jump in there and say that if people have questions and, um, you know, they can reach us on Twitter with hashtag teach the web and um, add it into the Google chat. And I know some people are starting to put links in underneath in the comment box. I saw um, that was great. Yeah, so you know, feel free to post other websites that or, you know, or other um, places for people to learn more about data privacy. Oh, and I don't know if I mentioned our um, privacy website that just launched this week, um, but Mozilla has one called Smart on Privacy um, that has a lot of really simple tips. Um, so I could probably figure out how to put that in the chat room. <laughs> I can I can do that. I'll find that. Okay, that would be great. Yeah, and also great if you're a teaching group, if you're like in the educational sphere, uh, sphere, those four steps are like easy to follow, and you could do them with a big group as well. Yes. Oh, lost my mute button. So a bunch of the things we had started talking about, and that Vinyesh's question really was talking about as well, is. Kind of corporate policies, and I know that um, there's a whole field of advocacy pertaining to this. Uh, obviously, we have Mozilla Advocacy. If people want to get involved with advocacy uh, for for privacy, what are kind of the steps they can take? What are options for people who want to kind of dig down to that next level and and get involved on an advocacy level? Um, yeah. So so like we talked about earlier, one of the easiest grassroots things to do is to share your knowledge and teach others. Um, you can definitely come join us um, as advocates and volunteers at Mozilla. So we have a Get Involved page and you can actually um, choose privacy as the area that you're interested in getting involved with. Um, we have a lot of Mozilla reps who regularly run privacy events. Um, that you can get involved with. Um, 
some other things that you can do. Um, there are several privacy advocacy organizations out there. There's the EFF, um, there's Privacy International, um, so those would be great organizations to look at. Um, there are, I mean, if you really <laughs> get interested in privacy, there are privacy professional organizations. There's one called the International Association of Privacy Professionals, um, and they run all kinds of informal privacy networking um, events where you can go and meet people who are interested in privacy. We're actually doing an informal networking event um, ourselves this afternoon. Um, from 3 to 5 p.m. Pacific time um, in San Francisco, sunny, sunny San Francisco, <laughs> and um, we are, um, we will be broadcasting that on our Air Mozilla system so that people can join from, from other areas as well, but we'll be having a speaker from the EFF um, who will be talking about the uh, State of the Union for our Consumer Privacy and EFF's wish list, and then we'll have time for people to get to know each other and to see what other people are working on. So I think some of those informal events are a really good way to do it um, for those who, who are starting to get interested and wanting to be involved in privacy. Can you tell us a little bit more about EFF? Yeah, um, so EFF is an advocacy organization um, with a really long history in privacy. They have all kinds of really interesting tools that you may want to check out. Um, they have something called the Privacy Badger. That's an add-on um, for your browser um, that can help you with tracking. Um, tracking protection, I should say. can help protect you. Um, they have, what was the name of the tool, Sarah, that, that oh, you're sharing, yeah. sharing with I'll me? I'll in the chat. Um, it is pa pan optic click. So you can yes, see. That's right. Um, and how unique and trackable is your browser? So I'm going to stick this into the chat and people can check. Um, actually, maybe if you could also explain a little bit about the results, because I did mine earlier on, and I was like, this is very in-depth. <laughs> I don't really know what it yeah. means. <laughs> um, and I, so when I tried it, it was a little technical for me as well. But what it's trying to tell you, basically, is how um, how unique is your browser. So, or not your browser. Is that your browser? Let me see. Yeah. I have a little bit of it. Um, so, so it gives you kind of a... A lot of information um, that was that was a little <laughs> it was a little much for someone non-technical like me um, but but interesting information it told me that my browser was in fact um, very unique um, and so fairly identifiable um, but I don't I unfortunately don't know enough about the tool maybe somebody who's on this chat might want to pipe in on that too well, um, more about it. here <laughs> And um, so what other kind of add-ons can you add, you know, to your browser to help privacy? Oh, um, there's a lot of them, actually. Um, so, so Firefox has a privacy add-ons collection, um, and I'm sure, I'm sure the other browsers probably do as well. Um, but there are all kinds of things. There's Ghostry, um, there's um, Adblock. Um, there's a wide variety of different things that can help you with your with privacy. There are things that can help you manage passwords. Um, there are things that can help you manage um, um, cookies being set on your machine. They're all kind of cookie buster kind of add-ons. So there's really a wide variety of stuff, and they're they're pretty well described um, in the add-ons marketplace, where you can get an idea of what they are, and you can also read other people's reviews. Um, to get an idea of which ones might be of interest. And we usually highlight, I think, the top 10 or 15 um, that are most popular. So I think that's a really good way for people to start, to go and look and see what's popular and see what looks interesting for you for issues that you're concerned about. And then there's been a lot of um, kind of activities floating around this week, and I know there's been a lot of talk, especially around Lightbeam. Um, can you tell us more about that? And I'll throw a link yeah. into that. Right. I would love to tell you about Lightbeam. Our add-on, so, <laughs> so I'm happy to tell you about that one. Um, so what Lightbeam does is it illuminates things that you normally wouldn't be able to see. So Lightbeam's actually really fun. I would encourage everybody to go look at it. 
and it's highlighted, I think, on the on our WebMaker page as well as an activity. Um, so it actually will walk you through how to teach others about Lightbeam. But what it does is it'll show you a visual representation of who's watching you online. So you'll go to a website and then it'll start populating with all these little, it almost looks like stars in the sky with lines between them, kind of like constellations almost, um, to show you all the different cookies that are being set when you go to a website and then you go to the next website and you see more cookies being set and you can you can hover over them and see which cookies they are and it's just really educational because obviously when you go to a website normally you don't see that that's all happening behind the scenes so it's really interesting to see what's happening behind the scenes again it's not necessarily that it's bad it's just that it's great to make it visible to people so that they know what's happening um, that they don't normally see so I would definitely recommend checking out Lightbeam and yeah. I have a, a super beginner question which I also ask I ask partially because I I do not know very much about the stuff and also because I think it's useful sometimes when you're teaching other people to, to be able to answer the nitty-gritty questions I'm wondering, uh, like, what is a cookie, and how does it let people track you? <laughs> oh my gosh! And here we are asking our most non-technical person at Mozilla. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you generally um, what a cookie is. Um, so I think if I, gosh, it'd be great if I had somebody technical in here with me. But I think it's a piece of code um, that gets set um, that lets people be able to keep track of some information about you. It's not personal information at all, so it's, it's really like the example that I was using for search engines. So a search engine would want to see what kinds of things you were searching for so that your search is more relevant. Um, others might use them, like if they're on um, a page that wants to show you advertising, for example, they're going to try to show you some advertising that's more relevant to you by being able to keep track of other pages that you visited, for example. Right. That's helpful. I understand that better now. Because I know my <laughs> theme is showing you that, but it doesn't tell you what a cookie is. <laughs> that's the non-technical explanation of cookies. <laughs> Okay. We actually, speaking of non-technical with cookies, um, we, we had a group of volunteers that actually wanted to go and um, have people trade um, um, signing away a bunch of pretend information for a real cookie so they would hand you a cookie and give you kind of a visualization of how cookies work but through real cookies. It was a cute idea. That's a web maker teaching kit waiting to happen right there. Exactly. The cookie game. Exactly. Meeting. I have another question here, um, not directly related to cookies or what we were talking about, but more back into the kind of advocacy sphere, which is what are our basic rights online? Like before we do anything, do we have some some basic rights? I guess in I'll I'll restrict it to kind of maybe the US for now, maybe they're different in different countries. Yeah, um, so that again gets into those questions of, of um, legal laws and regulations being different um, around the world. Um, so in the EU, definitely, um, privacy is viewed as a um, basic human right, and um, the data protection directives um, are very strong protections, um, and those have been around since I think the mid 90s, I think was when those came in. Um, in the United States, it's, it's much more secular, um, so you'll have more legal protections on things like financial data um, and healthcare data than you will um, basically online. Um, however, um, one protection of it that everyone in the United States does have is the FTC enforces um, an idea of um, doing what you say you are going to do. So if a company says in their privacy policy, I'm going to do X, and they don't, then that's actually enforceable for someone to to not, to misrepresent basically what they were doing. So there are some basic rights on things like that, and you can file complaints with agencies like the FTC if you feel like your rights are being violated. 
Okay, which actually leads into another question that I've <laughs> always had, which is if a, if a picture or something gets out there and it's being shared around on different sites and you don't want it to be shared, do you have any um, way of asking people to take it down? Is that, like, can you pull something back like that? Um, you can ask for it, yeah. Um, so, so I think there are, I've seen some really good articles online also on how to remove your digital footprint online, and they'll give you advice on, on how to do that. A lot of companies have procedures for you to request that something gets taken down. Um, there, are, there are areas where I think um, that may be more difficult to do. Um, I know, I know, revenge porn, for example, is a is a problem online where where people have really struggled to get images taken down. Um, but for the most part, um, it it's certainly something that you can ask for, and most companies have procedures um, for you to request that something be taken down. Good to know. There are recourse options. Just refreshing our Teach the Web um, hashtag, see if we've got any more questions coming through. I know we had another question that came through again on Discourse. Okay. Um, and it was because someone wants to know how can we get assurances online about our privacy is being that our privacy is being protected, or is it even possible to get these assurances? Who kind of links back into what we were talking about earlier on? Yeah. Um, Assurances. Um, I think your I think your best bet for assurances are companies' privacy policies. Um, as I mentioned, um, there there are obligations for companies to follow through on what they're saying that they're doing um, for their privacy policies. So I think that's your best assurance. Um, when you are entering data online, is really a good time <laughs> to to make sure that that you're familiar with their privacy policies and comfortable with what they're doing with the data and, and that you're looking for clues like whether they have a notice there that shows that they're, they, they're concerned about your privacy. Um, clues like that can be helpful. Um, but I think assurances are, are difficult. Um, privacy policies are probably the closest thing that we have. Okay, thanks. All right, so I think we have answered every question that I've ever had about data privacy uh, <laughs> and that we've received uh, on our various channels. If you do have questions after the fact, feel free to keep posting, and we'll reach out to Stacy, or we'll make sure they get answered some way. So uh, feel free to keep putting them in there. So as we start wrapping up, Stacy, are there any like last points that you want to get at how people can be smart for themselves online and how they can teach others? Um, just last points, it'd be great since today happens to be Data Privacy Day, if everybody could make an effort to do something um, in honor of today to um, either increase your own privacy knowledge or increase someone else's, um, preferably both would be great. Um, using resources like um, Mozilla's Smart on Privacy page that we just launched, um, as well as the tips on staysafeonline.org. Um, something like that, choosing an area that's of particular interest to you, maybe either mobile privacy, social networking, teenagers, whatever's of most interest to you, and taking action today would be great. Awesome. And it would be really great if you mentioned so many great articles <laughs> and links, so maybe um, later on we could, maybe tomorrow we can catch up and we can post out those links to people if they're interested. We yeah, I'd love to see those. those. That would be great on the bottom of this chat on the Google Hangout or also on Twitter and on the Discourse page. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. And this is a reminder to everyone that these amazing talks happen once a month near the end of the month, usually on the last Thursday. Um, and we will be announcing our next talk um, near the beginning of February and you can find all of that information by following us on Twitter at Webmaker, hashtag Teach the Web checking out the discourse pages, and there's also a wiki page. All of these links are in the Google Hangout, and you can find it there. We are also, this is going to be a recording. I'm sure some of you are watching it recorded. Hi, people who are watching the recording. <laughs> and it will be here 
uh, on the Google Hangout page to be watched as a recording, but we're also going to do some editing and put it on that wiki page uh, if you want to see a slightly more condensed version of it and possibly even podcast version. So thanks so much for joining us. Carry on the conversation on Twitter and discourse. Um, if you have more questions, we will get them answered. So thank you so much for watching. Do you guys have any last things to say? <laughs> thanks, everyone. Happy Privacy Day. Yeah. <laughs> happy Bye. Day Privacy Day. Bye, guys. Bye.